Hello and welcome to the next episode of the podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. This episode, as always, is brought to you by Seeds Here Now, your premier store for seeds, guaranteed not only on germination but also satisfaction, as well as 420 Australia, your number one store for lifestyle and apparel, and finally, the good folk over at Organic Gardening Solutions. You want that top shelf? Hit them up. On this episode, we're joined by Bushy Old Grower, otherwise known as Bog. Here to get some old school knowledge, some predictions for the future, and some other cool tidbits. Let's get into it. All right, so I'd like to welcome onto the show a true veteran of the scene, a man known as Bushy Old Grower, or simply Bog. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate it, and uh, I'm happy to talk to your folks. This would be great. So, a little deviation from the normal first question. What are you currently smoking on at the moment? Well, my wife and I are old school, you know, been smoking many years together, and uh, we're smoking my Sour Bubble. It's an elite breeder clone that we've had like 17 years now. And Sour Bubble is really a very unusual selection out of my straight bubble gum. It was supposed to be straight bubble gum. It was bubble gum from Amsterdam, and I called it Bog Bubble, my version of it, you know. And and we grew that for years. Every once in a while, and with the originals, we noticed that there were an occasional different phenotype, and it wasn't always exactly the same, but... Compared to bubble gum, the sour bubble, as I called it, uh, was a darker green and looked a lot like its leaf structure and plant structure like pre-98 Bubba Kush. And uh, it doesn't quite have that kind of flavor, but it, it's kind of uh, almost as cushy as bubble gummy, you know, for like a Bubba Kush, it's kind of unusually cushy. And we uh, had it uh, tested when we originally had that clone cut, and that was up in Anna when we lived in Bozeman. Uh, and it was 30.5% resin weight. Uh, now, that's all the THCs and the CBDs and all that put together. But back at that time, which was like, you know, 2001, I think, that was a really, really high THC clone that we selected out of the bubble gum that was normally uh, much lower, you know, more in the range of around 20% THC usually, just delicious and everything, you know, but this was a lot stronger and a lot tighter. It maybe didn't yield quite as much, but we had that sour bubble clone and we all just loved it, you know, the... the uh, the high is really quite indica sided. It's probably my most indica strain, and it uh, even has a little trait of the uh, leaf hands, where like pre ninety eight Bubba Kush, one of the tiniest little leaves sticks up like a finger, like you know the Three Stooges holding a teacup with their little finger sticking out. Somebody's showing me a picture of their pre ninety eight Bubba. Wow, and so. When you found the Sour Bubble clone, was your first thought like, I want to find the male version of this since you had the seed stock? Well, yes, exactly. And you know what? This is the thing. Uh, I had two or three of these different versions, and we decided this clone, this was, this was it. We were just calling it Super Bog Bubble at the time. And my son, who's also, you know, oh, he's a 42-year-old man down. He was a man at the time. Was, was helping me, and he, he decided, and I did, that this was the one we definitely wanted to keep this and breed with it. Well, we were growing from seed commercially up there in Montana. Now, I may have inadvertently um, violated a few statutes, but in Montana, uh, you may, a man's home is his castle, and, and you can pretty much do what you want to do in your home and they they can't get a search warrant for in a private owner's home at all, even if they think they're, they're fairly safe growing our own weed. We did it back in Michigan, too. But uh, we had kept growing the bog bubble, 
which was supposed to be straight bubble gum, but was obviously really above a cush. And uh, it took two years of continuously growing from seed uh, to come up with the mail. And I finally did, and it just it just appeared, and you could smell it, and you could see it, and it was obviously a sour bubble mail, and it was like, you know, a gift from above. I mean, honestly, I had been hoping and not seeing anything like it, because it's quite different than the bubblegum version that I have, you know, isolated in the bog bubble side. And so we were able then to make that first cross and then keep back crossing to uh, the original clone selection and uh, the sour bubble became a big hit back at the same time on overgrow which was like you know the big mega site back then that the guy i sent my seeds to came out with what was called og kush and it was the first og kush that any of us at overgrow have i know there's all kinds of stories about where it came from but uh I knew that he had it, and he sent me seeds and clones of his version. And I knew that we both had, you know, different versions. And I didn't, you know, I didn't call mine that. I, I came up with the name Sour Bubble. Right. And who was that person online? Well, I don't remember. It's a long time ago, and the guy did acknowledge this. His clone no longer exists. Um, this would be something to be investigated, but, you know, I mean, back in the day, we just, you know, knew each other by names and stuff and didn't keep anybody's names or addresses, but I had sent him my bog bubble seeds and my boggle gum seeds, which is bog bubble crossed with NL5, and that he had, had selected this clone out of either one or the other, okay? I'm not even sure which one, but I had assumed out of the bog bubble. Yep. So if we take a step back all the way to the start now before we get too deep into things, what was your first experience with cannabis? Oh, wow. Well, that was a long time ago. I think I was uh, only 13 years old, and... Um, I had moved from Birmingham, Michigan to Algonac, Michigan, which was on the water on the St. Clair River, which is part of the Great Lakes system and beautiful. And the new friends I met and we had boats and stuff and we could go camp on this island called Gull Island. And it was just paradise for like young teenagers, no parents and you know, I mean, we could take beer or anything. Well, one of my friends from Birmingham came up to visit and go with us to do this. And he had brought some pot for me to try. And I don't know why, but he didn't even want to smoke it. He had just gotten it. It was like enough to fill up a good-sized tobacco pipe. And it probably had a few seeds in it, you know. And anyhow, I was the only one who smoked it. And we got to the island, we set up our little tent or whatever, and everybody was having a great time. And I remember I sat down and I smoked that whole pipe load. I mean, we were we were cigarette smokers anyhow, so I, I didn't have much trouble at age 13 toking down that big tobacco pipe full of weed. And it was probably like some Mexican weed with a few seeds in it. And I got a damn good buzz off it. I mean, it took me about 15 minutes to smoke it, I think. And this was a fun night, let me tell you. Man, this island is only about, I don't know, half a mile long. And it's just sand with a few trees on it, I guess. And you can run around the whole damn thing in about half an hour, probably. But me and it was two or three other guys were out there after I got high and were running around on the beach and fooling around the water and I was just stoned and I'd never been stoned before I didn't really know all I knew was I was happy I was having a good time and before I knew it they, I see that they're laughing at me and uh, this is my one little friend who had brought the tobacco up I mean the, the marijuana up for me to smoke uh, he was laughing the hardest and it looked to me like he was he was putting his, his pecker away and I, I, what's going on here and he says you didn't even notice did you and I says what he says, I peed on your leg. You know, we're like standing in the water, but no, I had not. I had not felt any pee hit my leg. I said, did not. And 
you know, so anyhow, that was the first, uh, you know, adventure, I guess, on pot. And, you know, I could tell you what happened is we fooled around out there for a while. We ended up, I went back to the tent and I had the munchies like mad. I didn't, I, uh, I actually, I ate like a dozen donuts and drank like a two liter bottle of cola. <laughs> and I probably smoked about a pack of cigarettes. I had a damn good night. That's a great story. I like that a lot. So from there, did you, you know, decide that weed was your thing and you began to smoke it regularly or was there some time before you become like a regular smoker and got really engulfed in it? Well, that's interesting. I did love it. And I, I don't think that was actually one of those like totally addicting moments though, because no, I wasn't right out seeking it or anything like that. And it seems to me though, that the next time I got high, uh, that a buddy of mine and I, and I don't know, I can't remember that, but we got high and we went to a carnival and we rode the Lupo plane. And you know, the, the one where you hold the brake and the eggs sort of go upside down. Well, it, it, you lose all the change in your pockets, of course, and you know that's how they get a little extra money for the carnies. But we had a ball on that ride. I remember that ride, and me and the buddy us making that thing spin, and we were so high. And that was the second time, and that was the time that I really thought, "Geez, I've got to have this weed more often." So, I think it took a couple of happy evenings on it to then be convinced you know and i and i was then getting in at an age of like uh for sure by 16 but but i think at 15 i i had weed about half of the time because we could get bags of weed wasn't very good but a lid of weed which was like you know maybe a half an ounce even uh for for as little as 10 bucks maybe 12 bucks and there was a guy named Chief, and we had Indians that lived across the river. And so in Algonac, it wasn't too hard to find a guy named Chief who might sell a kid some weed. And uh, me and a buddy could, could get a lid from him for $12 usually. Damn, that's good. So at what point did you decide you wanted to start growing yourself and not just be a buyer? Well, uh, we... Even teenagers in high school were experimenting with growing pot. We lived in Michigan, which is a very northerly state in the U.S., and, you know, you, you, you get a fairly well. And, of course, we didn't really have the right kind of seeds that would finish early enough. But I remember that we were growing a few plants in the woods behind a friend of mine's house uh, back when we were only, like, 15. But we weren't having much success. But we got some leaves, and I remember that his name was Todd and and he was uh, he had a he had a bag of, of leaves you know that he chopped up and of course we smoked some of them and and he was actually rolling joints and selling joints in school and as i recall they were uh you know like uh, really cheap you know like he i can't remember how cheap maybe they might have even been as cheap as 3 for a dollar and uh you know like 50 cent joints so that's what i recall and they really weren't worth any more than that because you know they couldn't have had like more than half of a percent of thc but you know when you're kids about anything you can get right make it work that's we did actually though uh start trying to grow in earnest shortly after i got married uh, my my wife and I got married when we were 18 years old, and not because we had to. We had been going steady into high school years for two and a half, three years. She's a wonderful girl, and uh, Pat and I uh, got married, and then we had this uh, apartment for a year up at the college where I was going to school. And uh, my dad bought an old farmhouse just because he was buying the property up in that area. And I had some family up there in the, uh, central Michigan. And so, you know, oh, there was this old vacant house. I went and looked at it and asked if I could live in there. And he said, sure. 
So uh, once we were out there, which is like when I probably was less than 19, I was probably still 18, we were growing weed outside and, uh, you know, I was working on outdoor growing and it was kind of difficult, but, you know, I had some limited success and we were still usually mostly having to buy our from somebody. But, you know, we we always managed to have a little bit of it around and did eventually get better at growing. I did eventually get some plants to flower in the summertime and realized how good Cincinnati could be. And that was before I really even knew what it was. And that was probably in about 74. Right. And the... Uh, Really, what helped me living in Michigan was they came out with something called a, a halide light. And uh, I was already growing indoors before the halide light was invented. And I had been doing high output fluorescence grow tubes that were like eight feet long. And I also had some regular fluorescent four foot things. And so I had a room that could. Uh, it was, you know, equivalent to maybe a thousand watt room now or something like that. One big row of plants. And I had some limited success with that. But then with the limited genetics that I was able to obtain back then, uh, I would tend to get things that were, you know, that would run under lights like that. So when the halide light came out, all of a sudden I was able to grow top grade Cincinnati. And uh, I had also upgraded from my own seeds that I had worked on for years, you know, even back in Michigan, uh, but that I had then brought out to Montana when I moved out there and in earnest started trying to, you know, work on seeds. And I even, well, I went through a, a whole progression of different stages, but finally got some genetics from Amsterdam and some from Canada uh, and that sort of got my company started without intending to mm, okay and the stuff you were working on prior to that did you do you still use any of that at all or is it kind of just been outdated well the the first things that I worked with were from Michigan and some of it was just bag seed that I had crossed to this one strain that a friend of mine had in Michigan. And, uh, you know, he had an indoor halide light too, but he had done some outdoor growing there. And his strain was called Blanchard strain, which Blanchard is a small town in central Michigan, very rural. But his, his uh, plant, I remember, was just delicious. And I crossed, I had you know, what I called red was my own original first strain. And uh, my strain red tasted good and, and people liked it. But uh, his strain, the Blanchard strain, was a lot stronger. And it seemed more indica sided and very sweet. And it must have had some skunk in it, it seems to me. And, and I'm not sure what else, but it was a very sweet with the very bitter skunky leaves, you know. And it just uh, hard to say for sure. I mean, it wasn't like anything from local, but uh, stuff that had been around back when uh, the Grateful Dead were passing out seeds or something like a long time ago. Huh. Wow, yeah. And if they uh, actually, neither of those strains ended up in any of the work they did once we were selling seeds. So, no, I don't have those anymore. They'd just be so old now, they wouldn't work. I have had luck with seeds older than 10 years old, and I do keep old seeds. Uh, but, no, I don't have those anymore. In When you look on your library with all the genetics you've collected over the years, is there any older stock that you've got in there that you might want to work with, but you're thinking, oh, it's a bit old, I might not really be able to get it to germinate? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, we, of course, are always working on something new. 
and uh, it, it, with my, my company and, and the way I do things, sometimes it's a long time between a new strain because we got up to like 15 strains and uh, it became difficult as a small mom and pop operation to keep them all in stock. And I don't like discontinuing strains too much because I, you know, my niche is old school and I try to preserve the genetics as I got them originally. Now, I I have wonderful genetics that I was gifted by friends that people, when they knew that I was a breeder at Overgrow and we were actually selling my seeds worldwide, hell, I was the first American breeder to sell seeds worldwide through Gypsy. Uh, nobody was doing that from here. And then a, I brought a couple other guys in. Uh, uh, Reservoir Seeds, Res Dog, he became a big deal. And, you know, he... He was a friend of mine, and I was the one who talked Gypsy into bringing him in because he had so many good genetics, you know. But in my old school genetics, and, and Res Dog would say this, that, that Bog had the gum. And, and the fact is that the way we worked and progressed in each of our strains, all my strains have bubble gum in them. Uh, they used to call me the bubble gum guru. There's a little story about the bubble gum that I'd like to tell you. You know, when I was a little kid, I was a little businessman of a little kid. I was always uh, thinking about how to buy something cheap and sell it high. Honestly, I mean, when I was only 10 years old, I was buying and selling switchblade knives that I got some from Italy. And I also, when we were traveling, managed to to gamble and use slot machines and make money. And so I was always thinking about this. Well, when I was really young, one of the first times I got any money in my hand was like $5, you know? And I went down to the horse stable where they sold bubble gum. That's why this story is because I got a box with 500 pieces of bubble gum in it. And that was my first stash. This was the gateway drug they talk about pure sugar and it tasted like bubble gum so i took that box of bubble gum and i took it home and i guess i had to stash it somewhere so i hid it in the garage and i found a spot in the garage and luckily the mice didn't get them or maybe they got some and i didn't know but i used to go and grab me 20 pieces or so or my bubble gum and head to the movie theater and you know i'd be chewing bubble gum like a wacko so i was an abuser of bubble gum well, when I got bubblegum seeds from Amsterdam later when I was a grower, the last thing I really expected was the darn buds would actually smell like bubblegum. But we grew the plants and we hoped for the best. And when the plants got to be like four, four weeks in the four, I was fooling around and sniffing them. And I rubbed a stem, smelled my fingers, and my mouth dropped open. And I'm like, what the hell? It smells like bubble gum. I mean, how do you? How could that be possible? And I went up and I told my wife and son, who were both upstairs. I was living in Montana. I had a Montana basement. It was only like five feet high. It was horrible. You had to stoop all the time, and you couldn't use big lights because of the height restriction. But it smelled like bubble gum. And I went up and I told them that, and they both doubted my word. They, can you believe that? dad tells them and they don't think so and I, I said well look you go down there and you just check it out for yourself and they did and they both came back upstairs and their mouths were hanging open too and I'll tell you bubble gum really smells like bubble gum before it's done and uh, they were like how is that possible I said well the name that's on the seeds there you know it, it's actually uh, supposed to be bubble gum and uh we grew that and we were amazed uh, for one thing that it was a decent yielder and that we really liked the high, the indica high it was very relaxing and stuff. And we thought it was plenty strong enough for us. What I thought most about it was it was like candy that uh, who cares if it wasn't the strongest thing you could grow, it wasn't as strong as skunk or something like that. But I just couldn't believe how yummy it was. And I mean, that's all we smoked for years until we got hooked on the sour bubble and then that ended up being you no know, like we got totally addicted to that 
Wow, there's a lot of things I'm going to have to ask questions about. The f- so the first one is, do you remember who you got your bubble gum from breeder-wise? And is it the same as the one Adam Dunn took over there? Oh, well, actually, you know, it's Dronker's bubble gum, and he deserves some credit. Uh, my seeds were obtained through White Label Seed Company before they called it double gum. They did call it bubble gum. And uh, I had a small selection of those seeds. And, you know, he, he was the third guy who also had cloned, the real bubblegum clone. So uh, I say, yeah, and, uh, you know, I met and talked to Adam and the other guys, and the only one I didn't meet and talk to was, was Ben Dronkers. Ah, okay, interesting. Um, and so the next question I had, which I think everyone wants to know, is basically a lot of people sent me in uh, questions asking me to ask you about this. So I thought it, I'd better bring it up your relationship with the infamous res dog. So the, the, the question which struck me the most was a lot of people are familiar with sour dub, but they may not, you know, realize that it's obviously like a collab between you and res. How did that happen? And how did you meet res? Uh, well, res dog and I were friends online back in the overgrow day in the IC Mag days uh, from before he was a seed dealer. And uh, the sour dub was a cross I made of um, the New York City diesel from Soma uh, to my sour bubble clone. And uh, it doesn't have anything to do with any of ResDog's genetics. (laughs) <laughs> oh there you go maybe i missed up it's just um i might end up having to cut this question out because it looks like i made a blunder there but what did you guys do a collab i think i maybe just misspoke when i said sour dub um the the the, the question isn't uh wrong man i'll tell you there's definitely been some rumors around about uh either sour dub or sour bubble somehow being some kind of joint project between a res dog and me, and I'm sure he would confirm that that's that's really not true. Um, he may have sent me a few seeds at one time or another, but uh, as far as the sour bubble and the sour double, and you know, with the sour double, I didn't take that too far. I, I gave those first cross seeds to my dub out here in California. And he worked with that first cross seeds and gave me credit for the strain. And so uh, I can tell you that my original cross that I gave him uh, was, that's what it was, was so much New York City diesel and my sour bubble clone. And as it turned out, I should have kept that and bred that and made that a strain for myself uh, because it turned out to be really darn good and you know a lot of great things have descended from sour double Uh, the name sour double is a misnomer uh, because of the fact that the uh the sour diesel in my sour double wasn't sour diesel but was new york city diesel and so you got sour bubble with one sour and the other one actually new york city diesel so uh I didn't name it that. Yeah, okay, I understand what you're saying. So, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about Rez is, do you still stay in contact with him? And the the profile that popped up recently or, you know, a few months back, do you know if that was the actual Rez and if he does plan to return to the scene? No, I haven't been in touch with him since... Before he had some problems, you know, and we were both doing, you know, uh, sort of the same thing. So, no, we haven't been in contact with each other at all. And as far as whether the person who you're talking about, I haven't seen that or, or read that. So I can't help you there, but it's possible it's him. As far as I know, he's out and free and it could be. Okay. And so I guess the final question is, you know, feel free to decline or we can cut this one out if you don't want to. Um, 
ultimately, do you think he's the snitch that some people label him as? Well, I don't know. I honestly wouldn't have any way to know that. I, I, you know, a lot of these things are, are stuff that people read on the internet. And, and while I do know some people and maybe have had some inside stories, nobody ever convinced me that he's on anybody. And, uh, I, I guess I'm not that he did, but I sure can't say that he did. Yeah. Okay. So if we just jump back to another point you mentioned with the bubblegum story, your relationship with Gypsy. Gypsy is an interesting guy and there's not that many people around who had like a working relationship with him who are still active. What's your take on the Gypsy situation? And, you know, have you had any contact with him after he got out of uh, jail, I think at the start of the year? Yes, but I'm not really in regular contact with him now, but I did... uh you did uh, have a, an exchange uh, online since he got out. I know that uh, a wonderful friend of ours, a Buddhist, who sort of brought me into Buddhism, and his name is Tom, actually went over to the Philippines and sort of paid Gypsy's way out of this horrible, like, detention facility, you know, he was never convicted of any crime or anything. And the fact is that that's all it took was money to get him out of their corrupt system, you know, to be held without being charged with a crime. And they tried to send him back to the U.S. And uh, he actually fought as they were trying to board him on the plane that was going to take him to the U.S. because the U.S. wanted to extradite him. Yeah, and, and because he caused a commotion, they uh, they took him back to the holding facility, and it he, he didn't he ended up not being extradited to the U.S. Lucky for him, because you know guys like him uh, they they really would throw in the book at him. Yeah. Okay. And so I think um, the interesting thing about Gypsy is it's kind of like back at that same time frame as when Overgrow was around. And I think you have kind of the uh, the cool fact of being able to say you were the twelfth member on Overgrow, which is obviously kind of confirms your OGness. Do you think though that people look back on Overgrow with a sort of rose shaded glasses, and there's a certain sense of romanticizing going on, or do you think that it is kind of like what people make it out to be of like where it was this mecca of information, and it's such a shame we don't have something like that anymore. When Overgrow opened, it was like a birthday present to me. I mean, if you realized what there was before that was practically nothing. And uh, the, the British Columbian Seed Company had a, a forum thread where there was like one page with one constant thread where people could add something to the chat line, you know, and that was it. And I remember I posted my whole um, indoor organic grow tips uh, you know, for for uh, new growers on that, like, chat forum thing. And even though it wasn't really meant for that, they didn't object. And then when Overgrow came out, uh, I right away had the same thread there. And it evolved into a thing where for, like, years, people would just come in and ask a question. And it was, you know, these were really long threads. I remember they had a room called the shark's tank and that was where anything goes you know and uh i had a thread called the new world order and uh, it was it, you know it had some conspiracy theory stuff in it and stuff and you know bog bushy old grower i mean there was a aspect of some mythology i mean we were kidding around and joking around and you know my great 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 Great, 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 great granddaddy wasn't really an alien who came down to Egypt with marijuana seeds because the sun is a perfect grow light. <laughs> but we came up with stuff like that. You know, I didn't mean, didn't mean any harm. <laughs> That's great. That's a crack up. And so what was your kind of reaction to when it all got shut down? Well, it was it was horrifying because... We were doing business. We they had uh, each seed company like like well 
Gypsy Nirvana and his like Seeds Direct at the time or whatever it was called. And we had our own forum at all. And so like before Overgrow actually shut down, uh, RC who ran Overgrow and was connected with BC Seed Bank and stuff, decided to close down all the private seed forums, which had sort of put us off of the the public pages and into our own forums so that we wouldn't offend it. But that's what Overgrow was all about and teaching each other how to grow. I wanted to talk about Overgrow because it was it was better than you think. It wasn't over romanticized. It was awesomely huge for the time. You know, Al Gore, he claims he invented the internet, but I helped to invent social networking because at Overgrow, we had what was called karma. And you could give somebody good or bad karma. And giving bad karma was bad, but they actually could, you could do it, okay? And so I uh, quickly accumulated a lot of good karma uh, because I was teaching people basic methods of growing indoors in a time when it was all totally illegal and you, nobody knew anything, you know? And it was like, to be able to get this off of your computer, I mean, people were sitting around getting high, learning how to grow, and as soon as they learned something, they were teaching it to the next guy. And this was really a, a great thing. You know, I mean, if you love marijuana, this is why, you know, so many people in the world know me. It's because I was a big deal at Overgrow. And, you know, I was just posting my pictures of my flowers to show off. And I never had planned on having a seed company at all. I mean, I was just happy growing my weed and selling my weed. I mean, prices were good. And my, 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 but then uh, Gypsy Nirvana, who was the seed dealer, he saw how popular I was, how many views I had, how much karma I had. I mean, I was on there every day. I wasn't working. I was a grower. I was spending 20 hours a week, and I was uploading photos every day, and I was showing all kinds of cool stuff. It was a lot of fun because... It was all new. The internet was new. The idea of posting a picture was, you know, awesome. And uh, so I just want to say that my teaching threads and uh, my our picture forum show off threads, we had contests and things. Overgrow was really pretty far out. And it still suffered from the same kind of things we have now. Like we have trolls and things. But, you know, one year we had this big contest at Overgrow, and there was like five or ten categories of things people could win. And top one was Grower of the Year, and uh, yours truly did win Grower of the Year, the only year that Overgrow did that contest. And so many people voted for me because of popularity, not really because I was the best grower, you see. And so... It was because I had my fan base, because people liked me, because you could, they could see that I was answering everybody's questions every day. And so, so I was providing a service where anybody could come into my thread. And I mean, I wasn't the only one, but my methods were simple and basic, and it was all written so that any idiot could figure it out. And so what would you say is the biggest difference in the community when comparing things between now and back then? Well, it's changed a lot. You know, there are still sites like that, like uh, um, I, I it still exists and runs, and there's still some traffic there. But social networking has evolved, you know, and I mean, everybody's on um, the Instagram, the Twitters, the YouTube and the big sites have sort of like sucked up all the all the others. And, and uh, Overgrow was a huge mega site in its day. I mean, it had over a million members. I guess that probably wouldn't be that big a deal now. But not that many people were on the Internet back then. And that's not, you know, even people that just came one time might have been considered a member. You know, who knows if they jacked it. But we had a lot of people there. And when you put something out, you definitely got a bunch of responses in a hurry. But I like the way Instagram is now, and I like the way things have evolved. The truth is that uh, it was tedious wading through the threads in the forums, and now 
it seems like it evolved in a natural way where you decide that you want to follow somebody like I'm on Instagram and you can just, you know, look for bog or bog seeds and you, you can become a follower on our feed. And every time I post a new picture or say something, you get a little notice that, Hey, your guy's up. You want to have a look? So I kind of like it. It's like I get an instant response from the Instagram. It's where I do most of my stuff now. Yeah, I agree with a lot of those points. And so I guess kind of maybe the last question about Overgrow. Were there any people who you saw back in the early days of Overgrow and you had a feeling they would go on to do bigger things and, you know, true to form, that prediction has come true and now maybe they're, you know, some of the more relevant people in the industry? Well, I'm sure that's true, but it's been so long ago that, I mean, I got most of these people like we all we knew each other by was was our online handles. And, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not the best with names, but I've been out doing events for a long time and we run into each other. And uh, when we do, it's fun. And I like the fact that people recognize me from on Overgrow. And that they want to meet me because they really thought I was, you know, like a huge leader on the site. And then at the time there I was, and I was a good guy, you know. I mean, I was always telling people to be nice and charitable. And honestly, I I, I uh, fooled around and maybe was a little off color sometimes about, I would say things like that my plants, you know, because they were they. Were, or girls or Cincinnati that they were my virgins you know and we would make jokes sometimes that I guess you know I, once in a while could have been a little too much but we were just having fun and it compared to some of the stuff you see out there now the overgrow was pretty tame um, it seemed like that was fairly well moderated and that uh, I know that I couldn't get away with just anything and that uh Neither could anybody else. So honestly, I think that that sometimes the less responsible uh, places where there, you know, there's chats all over the place. Every game's got one and things like that. So, you know, there's all kinds of trolls out there being nasty. We we had a pretty nice place. Fantastic. So, I know that you have put out some um, soil mixes of your own. Maybe a bit of a redundant question. But are you an organic grower or more like a synthetic slash bottled nutrients grower? Well, I've always promoted organic methods. And while some people have said maybe I'm not always totally organic on everything, you know, I had a guy dispute that peat, you know, like peat moss in your soil, that that's not organic. Well, it seems organic to me. Anyhow, if it's not, it's organic enough. And I try to stay away from anything synthetic. And, you know, like insecticides and things like that aren't even legal in California. You can't even buy them. So they have all kinds of alternative treatments and things that don't involve that. But, you know, I, I've been through all kinds of things and we've used all kinds of stuff, at different stages. Now we know better, you know, like if you know what you're doing, you don't get too many pests because, uh, you know, there are good products. Or if you're doing it indoors, you're not letting any of that get inside anyhow. But uh, yeah, so I guess my question we, then is, because you've probably had a really wide exposure to, you know, over the years, you've tried a whole bunch of different samples from a variety of different growers. Do you think at the absolute pinnacle of both organic production and synthetic production, do you think there's still a difference? Do you think like organic is still the best when they're both at their optimal levels? Or do you think it's just still, you know, devils in the detail type of thing? I think organic's still best, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I know that yields can be larger, and it's really not an issue of that. But I do think that the flavor is better. And, you know, all the uh, growers that are, are growing outdoors and growing in greenhouses are also in competition with organic products that are grown indoors too. And 
believe me, that's the the best product and the highest price is given for indoor organic. Now, indoor generally brings a higher price than than the outdoor, of course, and especially, you know, if you think you can get the same quality, I'd like I'd like to see it. But a controlled environment and you know, if I, I know that you know the sun, but. Being outdoors is, is rough around plants, and finishing plants indoors allows you to get the quality higher. And so overall, are you just primarily indoor guy, or is your favorite outdoor, or where do you sit? We're mainly indoor growers, and now, you know, we're mainly just a pretty small grow to produce seeds, and it's like uh, not not producing a lot of we just weed for my family. Uh, and a little extra, but uh, we are trying to uh, downsize in a way that we pretty much just produce enough seeds to keep the business going and about the level it's going right now. We really don't want to uh, become a huge company. In fact, some of my best friends, you know, advised me that it is best to keep it small. And it does seem to me that it's a lot less worries and you know we don't have to have employees or a whole lot of complications because you know i'm i'm getting older I, i'm getting ready to retire i'm nearly 64 and what i would like to do is just be able to keep supplying some distributors and and live economically i don't need to live large anymore i've done that yeah frugal man i like that so I mean, just kind of touching on distributors, do you ever get requests from distributors or maybe even fans and customers, probably the more relevant person, to kind of change up some of the genetics? And I guess the question I always like to ask people is, when I notice that a breeder tends to stick to a more old school pool of genetics, a good example is our friend, the Mad Farmer, he, like you, sticks to the old school stuff that he knows. With that in mind, do you ever consider giving in to the request to maybe bring in a strain of the month and spice things up a bit? Yeah, but I'm still like the old school guy who doesn't that kind of resists that. And that's because if I really had the time to do the work with something else, I still think that I'd rather continue to uh, work on and select from my old school genetics. And it's not very often. I mean, okay, there are great strains, and they come out. You think, I should jump on this one or that one. Like when Sour Diesel first showed up, well, maybe better get some of that. wasn't really my thing, okay? I really would rather, you know, be related but not the same and, and come up with my own. Now, a project that I'm working on right now is all my old genetics, but – uh, used in a different way. And another project that I'm considering doing is taking some high quality pollens from another fine breeder uh, and using that probably on my sour bubble clone because it seems to be, have the genetics still. The old clone may have declined a bit as far as the quality of its buds over so many years, but its genetics are still throwing awesome phenotypes and so yeah there is a possibility that within the next year or two uh, or less than a year that we'll at least be working on something crossed to my sour bubble that is from someone else um, currently I do have a new strain that is a cross of a couple of my strains it's been reselected and worked on it's a uh, high yielder and it's a more inclined to be a great outdoor bush, but uh, these also tend to yield well inside. We have uh, a number of strains that are good yielders and mold resistant. And where I'm at here, the outdoor growers need mold resistant. We're kind of coastal, uh, and there's a lot of growers in California that are. And uh, the other parts of the country Everybody in the fall, when the weather turns colder and it gets cold at night, doesn't even have to rain for the mold to set in. And outdoor growers, you know, it's real, really disappointing, you know. And so 
working on these types of strains. The strain is going to be called Bluetooth, and it's actually a cross of my Blue Moon Rocks and my Sweet Cindy. Now, Sweet Cindy, everybody tended to think was like mostly going to be like Cinderella 99. And there is a little Cinderella 99 in it, but it's a lot more like Sweet Tooth 3. And the fact is that that's what the sweet in the Sweet Cindy stands for. Now, the Blue Moon Rocks and the Sweet Cindy will already has shown to, in testing, produce some mega fat colas. And so we're pretty excited about it. We know that it's, it's good tasting and good weed and that it is mold resistant. So we've gone ahead with this cross and we hope to be releasing it later this year. Wow, that's exciting. So, I mean, just to touch on the point you made about the mold resistance, I noticed that you do list um, in some kind of uh, descriptions that you like to breed for mold resistance and hardiness in general. Do you feel that in order to do this, it's done mostly via a selection process or more of like a byproduct of the fact that you're breeding and acclimatizing them in an environment which would help to cater for that? Well, that's a good question. You know, for one thing, I'll tell you this. A lot of times things boil down to being a little simpler than you think, but not always. The mold resistant strains are not the most indica sided ones, okay? In my experience, the sativas being, you know, uh, not so large, heavy, and tight of uh, buds uh, just tend to resist it better. Also, the really dark green leafy types seem to me to be more likely to mold. And so my most indica strains, and blue moon rocks is quite indica sided, but it doesn't mold. And so it's not just that. Um, we did grow in places, and you asked for an indoor grower. No, we grew outdoors too. And some of my seeds have been made outdoors and were made outdoors, even if they're also been made indoors. And so we were thinking about two different things in our different kinds of plants. And but one type of plants, they either have to be early finishing or mold resistant and likely to finish in most places. And the early finishers are my sour strawberry, my blue kush, the mold resistant large yielders that finished in time are bottle gum. You see bottle gum's got NL5 with the bubble gum. It's like antifreeze from the great white north and nothing stops that. Lifesaver, which we haven't talked about, very mold resistant, large yielder, great outdoors. And Sweet Sydney also. So uh, the, the uh, Lifesaver, the Boggle Gum, and the Blue Moon Rocks, and the Sweet Cindy uh, yield well, finish in reasonable time, and resist the mold. Now, it's been true, and it continues to be true. And all I can say is that I do my best not to just keep inbreeding my seeds, but to do a rotation where I go back to an earlier set of seeds that I saved in my breeder's seeds. And, you know, I keep clones. It's just that, that you know, at times you have to reselect clones. But I've kept the same uh, sour bubble clone the longest, which is essential to all my sour strains and blue kush. Yeah, definitely one of the more long-held ones. So, I mean, if we just touch on something you mentioned a question or two ago about I think you said, you know, like it would have been neat to know that sour diesel was going to be the big thing at the time. But, you know, there was other reasons why you didn't get into it. Just on that general line of thought, what's your opinion on the general trending nature of strains? Do you kind of keep an eye on what's on the come up? And would you ever try to be ahead of the curb, so to speak? Like, do you ever get the feeling that maybe some bubble gum slash, you know, the kind of your flavors are on the rise? And would you try to anticipate that if so? Well, I, you know, I, I may not be quite as up-to-date on everything as I was back in the day, but it does seem some of the work that's being done with a couple of Africans, you know, uh, people are raving about, and that there may be some things that, you know, I'm not aware of and that I haven't even tried. But 
you're right about people giving me seeds at samples and uh, events that I have a lot of people who like remember me from long ago and they see me and they know I'm going to be there or whatever and they bring seeds for me. And so a lot of other guys, you know, startup companies, good growers, I mean, you know, we definitely respect some of the newer companies than us, so don't get me wrong on that. It's just that there are so many small companies now that, you know, everybody seems to jump bandwagon with the new popular strain. And, you know, I've been a couple of times I was tempted. I mean, to me, Girl Scout cookies is pretty remarkably my type of weed, okay? Uh, it's definitely got traces of pre-98 bubble in it that, that uh, I love our bubble is it in there. Sorry, what was that last bit? You think maybe some sour bubbles in there? Well, I just mean that the pre-98 bubble, I believe, is in the sour bowl. And that's part of the reason I love Girl Scout cookies, too, because I think I, I taste it in there. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that comment a few times as well. So while we're on the topic of, you know, seed businesses and just that general nature, what's your opinion on what some would describe as the rising nature of seed prices? Because some breeders have pointed out that most people are relatively charging about the same thing if you compare the prices in while accounting for inflation to, say, companies in the 90s. However, there's obviously a lot of clear examples where this, there are people charging you know, quite large price tags associated with their seeds, and it's obviously not proportional. How do you feel about this general idea? You know, do you think there should be a limit? Do you think it's just a capitalist thing where it's like, you know, if someone wants to pay, how, where do you sit on it all? Well, I always wanted to be competitive. And the thing is, uh, uh, I didn't want to be the lowest or the highest. I think that it's important that you provide a good value. And uh, I, I don't know. I think if something's brand new and they want to auction it off and they can get a high price for it, if something's really good enough that, that people will pay their prices for it, you can't blame people for I mean, it, you know, business is business and they're probably going to charge what they can. But I I think that there's a little bit of old school business morality that a lot of people could uh, and that is that you want the customer to be satisfied you want them to return and use your seeds again i'm more about return customers than trying to to fish up a whole bunch of new guys but like right now in states that have gone here in the usa anybody can grow four or five plants legally and they don't need any permits or anything like that, you know, unless there's some local ordinance that might prevent them. The state law lets people grow a few plants. So it seems to me that there could be a lot of new growers and my seeds are easy to grow. I tell them which ones are the easiest. People usually, we recommend the boggle gum. We could call it bulletproof, you know, it tastes like bubble gum, but it's got the NL5 in it, which makes it uh, resistant to almost everything, every mistake you can make, and it'll it'll produce something even if you you know forget to feed it. So we often tell people, you know, it's it's really good for beginners, but not for beginners only. Um, Boggle gum was a medical strain, and we didn't even call it that back at the time. But uh, it was sold as such in Canada online for $350 an ounce for a number of years. And I don't know how they got away with that. But when I went up to Vancouver, I found places like the, the melting point where Bubble Man had his vaporizers all in view in the open windows on the main street. And cops walking by had all my stuff out on the table. And we were all getting high up there many years ago. Sounds good. <laughs> so you just mentioned the NL5. I wanted to ask you about it. Where did you get yours from? And do you have any speculations on what the genetics behind it are? Oh, that's a good question. You know what? There's probably somebody who does know the answer there. I can tell you where I got them. Uh, the NL5, a BC company, a British Columbia Seed Company, 
they sold not just Northern Lights, it was back before they just sold Northern Lights, and they did sell Northern Light 5 seeds, which another guy obtained and transferred them to me, and he had the name he had written on his own tag, so I didn't get the package or anything, but they were alleged to be an L5, and I grew them out, and they were different than just Northern Lights. I can say this, that it was pretty decided. And the plant structure was exactly like a Christmas tree. And it had a lot of green, sort of like menthol or greenness to its composition, okay? And it was good smoke, but not quite as good as the Amsterdam bubblegum that I had grown and gotten from Dronkers. But it was rugged and hardy, and it was good. So we did that cross because those were the first two uh, sets of imported seeds I had obtained. So it was kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, okay. And it's also one which is still around, you still, you know, use it to this day. Do you feel that's because it's, you know, it's still solid or it's more so because you kind of, you want to still be able to offer those strains it was used in the creation for? Well, <clears throat> we pretty much, uh, for our own use, grow indoors and we've lately just been growing three of our strains from three clones that we've got running. And, you know, one's Sour Bubble, one's uh, the Sour Grape, and one is the Blue Moon Rocks. And we were running more types, but we're kind of downsizing on the pot growing and, and trying to just continue to keep up on the seed growing now. So those are the three clones I have selected and that we're growing right now. And I'm growing from seeds and working on the the Bluetooth project, and so really we've gotten most of the work done on that now, and we're just doing our final uh, final room full of it to come out with the seeds later this fall. Yeah, okay. So something our viewers love to always hear from the guests is, what are some of the traits you like to look for when selecting a male? Well, you know, males have smell. And, of course, with my strains, it's not too hard for me to select males because I have a couple of tricks. Now, yes, you have to reselect males. And, you know, the fact is that it's best to go back to older seeds that you have than maybe the ones that you're also growing. But find a male as close to back when it was early as you can. And then I am not one to use just one male. Now, I suppose somebody thinks that's not right, but I am uh, not always trying to get them all to be as identical as clones. I mean, I've had strains get that way, and it gets a little boring. And so I think that it's fun when it's my sour strawberry where you do have more than one phenotype that you're going to get in a pack of seeds. And it may sound backwards as far as stability, but I'll, I've got plenty of strains that are quite stable. I've been making them for a long time, and being able to know what the right male is supposed to look like and smell like, because I've done it so many times, makes it easier for me to reselect males. Do you subscribe to the idea of trying to find a male, for example, which may be as closely as possible mirrors a female of the same strain that you find very desirable? Or do you think there's some intrinsic differences, which means you can't just necessarily do what I mentioned? It depends on, on the breeding project, okay? Like uh, every one of my strains wasn't made the same way, and I don't like to go into every detail about it, but like I explained uh, with the sour bubble, yeah, if you've if you've got a clone, you want to produce seeds like that clone. I'm not I'm not one to feminize. Okay, I don't feminize seeds. We've never sold feminized seeds. I have a story for you about feminizing seeds. Yes, I did do it at one time. But uh, well, the reason I don't do it is because you feminize seeds. It'll be fine, possibly, for the next generation, but if they use those seeds to make more seeds, the hermaphrodite tendencies definitely come out. And so I expected that people would take my seeds and probably make some more seeds of their own. 
at least when I started this company, it's more the way it was, you know, than, than people are just going to buy loads of seeds. So given you've had some clients, for, you know, 15 plus years, I'd love to get your opinion on this topic of genetic drift. Do you believe that over time, females and maybe even males for that matter, can deteriorate in quality? Or do you feel that for the most part, you know, the same plant is the same plant? I would say that the genetics doesn't change, but that a clone, the quality of its bud and the numbers on its THC and stuff definitely can decline. Uh, there, it's not because of genetic alteration, okay? That's not that easy to do. And, you know, I don't think the plant would be healthy if that was going on. I think the genetics of clones are pretty solid. Uh, but I do think that the process of selection is one thing, uh, even with clones, and that a line can deteriorate over time. I don't think my sour bubble clone, you know, being like 17 years old, I don't think I could get it to test out as high as when it was brand new, you know. I saw it come down some, and I still love it. But uh, they, there are theories of ways to take a clone that's sort of run down and refurbish it. And the only one I've ever really heard is to take it outside for a summer and let it let it live like a real tree, you know? Yeah. So do you think that there is a, a poster child in regards to all the strains you've made that represent bog seeds? Like, is there one strain which you think really embodies bog seeds? Oh, well, it's either the original bubblegum bog bubble or sour bubble. Bog Bubble was no flagship, and the Sour Bubble kind of became the new leader, and all the strains got bred to the Sour Bubble. It's kind of a similar story to one that Soma told after years of all his strains being developed. He finally had this one male that he decided was so good that he had to cross that to all his strains, and he came out with a whole second set of strains. The thing I wanted to go back to for a second, what I didn't really answer was like the type of breeding projects. And and I mentioned that with uh, trying to make seeds from a clone, I got, I got off the track on to why I don't feminize. But uh, by finding that perfect match, like I did for the Sour Bubble, that really was important to getting those first seeds from the clone, and that that, you know, was the main thing in the breeding project that mattered the most. The different batches and the numbers of back crosses, uh, the further you got away from the clone, uh, the better they would yield. Uh, but, you know, I think at a certain point, like back cross four, you wouldn't want to go any further away. So we, we would go back and start over again. But with a lot of my strains, I don't think that, you know, any breeding project, when you start it, you really don't know what, what you're going to get. And so it's kind of a crapshoot. And I always told people to follow their intuitions and to, to know what they're hoping for and and to wish for that and that it, it could make it happen. And it, it's, it, it's a spiritual power that we have. Yeah, okay. And so do you think that there's something more to breeding than just purely a, say, criteria of things you're looking for? Is there kind of a certain amount of intuition involved also? Yeah, I, I'm that type of breeder like Soma, who, you know, is, is, is kind of a believer in a lot of things, okay? A lot of junk, uh, spiritualism and stuff. I mentioned to you about my new world order thread and how, you know, conspiracy theories and things like that. Well, I worked in medicine for a number of years and I then went to alternative medicine for a while, like a naturopathic therapist. And I kind of believe in, in the power that people have to help each other. Like, like in massage, for example, um, the human touch is, 
single crave and is therapeutic and in a way you do it but there's something called intention and attention and so if your intention were to make pain go away in his lower back or neck for example and the and you paid attention to that by concentrating on it and working on it and massaging it or whatever you do, manipulating it, that because of your intent and attention, that you'll use your spiritual power and that that person can, can feel it, can benefit. We are creative, and it's not all science. Now, I love science. And I wish I knew more science. I mean, I, that's the thing I like to read. And I'm a science fiction fan, you know. I just love space and rockets and everything like that. So I don't diss science. I uh, was good at science. And I liked biology and science like that. But I didn't have a degree in genetics or even agriculture, okay? I mean, I was like political science, English law, and stuff like that, regular old college program that eventually, you know, I ended up having my first child at 21 years old and leaving my first session in college early uh, to go to work. And so I ended up going back to school and stuff, but that's a whole nother story. So you touched on science there. Do you like to engage in the new emerging technology and sciences that are kind of touted to help breeders? Like, for example, do you use any of, not just like, you know, an analytical lab testing for, for cannabinoid values, but like maybe the ones where they help you to detect males earlier on or things like that? No, I, I never use those guys. And, and no, I am not saying that testing isn't valid or anything, okay? And we... We've had plenty of tests on plenty of our strains, and you know, uh, my my weed, uh, different kinds, been sold in California by dispensaries for years, and a lot of times they would they would send a sample in and get it tested. You know, I'm cheap; I don't like to pay for testing. But the kind of testing I really believe in, being with the medical background, is more like clinical testing, and that would be the results. And I know that that's anecdotal and harder to nail down than the THC content or the CBNA or whatever else new component. I understand a little bit about THC. Um, I understand enough about it to know that I like my strains high THC with a little bit of CBD and that uh, indica sided strains like that, like my sour bubble, kill my pain the best they are a bit on the couchy side for some people but it stimulates my brain now i got i got pretty high on it before we did this session and it's not like i'm sleepy or anything and i've only had a sip of coffee yeah well there you go i mean do you consider yourself to have a high tolerance or more just um like you know because it's for a medical need it helps to counteract the maybe sedative side other people experience some people would say we have a high tolerance because my wife and I smoke a lot. But the truth is that you could get a higher tolerance by using more edibles, and we do eat edible now and then, but not that regular. And, you know, um, you, you get a high content using concentrates and things like that. We, uh, we make bubble hash, and sometimes we'll add a little of that to our joint if we want to pep it up, you know. But... I wouldn't say that we could take it all that much at any one time, you know. I mean, we're older, um, we like to get high, and there are some highs that are too busy for me that I don't even like, that are like um, really, really sativa-sided strains sometimes that, uh, you know, it just it makes me a little anxious. Or, so I, I kind of prefer the, the uh, indica high. There you go. That segues perfectly into my next question where I was going to say that a lot of your strains tend to have this commonality of a relatively short flowering time. And obviously that lends itself more towards the indica side of genetics. Was this intentional or is it just kind of how things worked out? 
Oh, it was intentional. Being an indoor grower myself, I mean, I actually came up with my own uh, self for a, a plant, a strain that I called the the grower's rating scale rather than the smoker's rating scale, okay? And so, like, growers, they're the ones that have to work with it. I I like a strain that finishes in, like, seven and a half, eight and a half weeks. And it's long enough to get a pretty darn good yield. You know, I do have uh, two or three that take longer to finish. Um, like indoors, my LSD and my Lifestar, they both take uh, at least 10, maybe 11 weeks indoors, and they're a little late finishing outside. Uh, but the LSD is quite mold resistant, and uh, the uh, Lifestar probably should be too, although I'm really, really not sure on that. But yeah, I, you know, being an indoor grower, I want things to move along, you know, and I I, uh, I I do what's called you know continuous production now. I called it Bonanza Green when I wrote my book back in the day. It described how we keep the plants moving, you know, from a bedroom to a flowering room and on down the line in the flowering room till they reach the end of the room and where they get sort of set aside from the lights for a couple more days where they can still see the light but finish up and could sort of get the most out of the room that way. It's more efficient. Part of the grower's scale would involve the amount of energy required to get how much yield back. And so fewer weeks of flowering definitely would be a factor in that. And so we were looking at it commercially too, that, you know, there's some great long flowering strains, but unless the yields are going to be really big, you don't want that indoors. And the other thing is, if, if the yields are really big and they take a long time, then the plant's still more susceptible to problems than a fast flowering plant, like, you know, mold or bugs or anything. Yeah, totally. So some people may not have been aware of what you just referenced, but you have written your own book called Bonanza of Green, and I was going to ask you about it. What inspired you to write it? Was it kind of the case that you set out to write the book, or was it more that you were giving out all this info and just over time you were kind of like, hey, I've got like a book's worth of stuff here? Well, that's exactly it. I kept writing the same shit over and over again, you know, and I really got to thinking, we, we ought to do this, you know. I mean, my my wife was working at the time, but I was uh, off work, and it could have never got done without her help. I mean, we're both literate and all, but she's, you know, more perfectionistic, and she made sure that the paragraphs made sense to everyone. My book was meant to be simple and to entice people into growing, and then also to you know, show them pictures of my strains in the back of the book and re recommend that they get seeds from us. So you know, part of it was a promotional thing for my seeds, but it never turned out to be that big a deal. And we, we got a thousand copies printed, and since then we've just been burning them on CDs and sending them to people. You know, uh, it was on the Google Play for some time, and it may still be out there online. It's Bonanza Green by Bushy Old Grower. There you go. Check it out, people. So I wanted to ask you this one question. I didn't know how to slot it in, so we're just going to do it here. Lifesaver, your cross, it's an interesting one to me because on face value, from what I can see, it's one of the only ones where it's made using two different breeders' genetics. Would you ever consider doing that again, or was that kind of a one-off special thing? No, I would consider doing that again, and, and that was a time when I used Subcool's genetics, and I'll give him all the credit in the world for his JCB, Jack's Cleaner Blueberry, incredibly fast flowering strain and very good bud. And, you know, it was good enough that I wanted to cross it to my bubble gum, which was very fast. I mean, the original bog bubble, it was probably faster finishing than it is now. Maybe it was a difference in the way I grew it, but... I mean, we were getting it to finish in like, you know, seven weeks. And so his, he had some, if he knows, he claimed even finished in like 42 days, 43 days or something like that. 
And, you know, that's like too fast, but they were fast. They were at least as fast as my, my bog bubble. So I did cross those together. And like I said, I've been talking to James at Seeds here now about uh, possibly using some pollen from a very uh, uh, well-known breeder. I don't want to mention the name until we actually go forward with the project. But at this point, I've said that, you know, I might take some select pollen to work with on my strains. Ah, that'd be interesting. And I think I might know who you're talking about, but we'll leave that to be seen. What I did want to ask, though, is I don't know if you're aware, but there's a few people in the scene who are very reminiscent about the strain Bubbleberry that was offered by Saga Martha Seeds many years ago. And I noticed that you essentially offer, you know, a very similar version to that strain, like a blueberry cross to a bubblegum type of thing. Have you ever noticed this similarity and thought maybe I should try to work this a bit more? Well, I am aware of his strain by name, and I never actually tried it or worked with it, but I did have some friends in Amsterdam that told me that his bubble berry was excellent tasting okay now uh well there's several company of bubblegum blueberries you know it was not a it intended to copy him uh it was done probably pretty much at the same time and i don't think we used exactly the same components or anything so uh of course they're related i mean of course they both have bubblegum and they both have blueberry in them but he and I didn't work together on it. I didn't uh, take his genetics and use them, and he didn't take mine and use them, I don't think, either. Yeah, of course. So one question I love to ask the guests, because our viewers always love to hear it, is do you have any tips for pheno hunting? And so what I mean by that is do you, for example, maybe prefer to run a lot of plants in small pots and just see how they go, or do you like to let them get big to get a true test of them what's what's your method when you're going to pop some seeds and try to determine what's worth keeping well, what a great question you know i'm always doing this all right and the thing is right now you know like i was telling you my sour bubble clone great for breeding definitely the genetics are still just popping but we decided to again look for another select sour bubble mother and uh, we went through a group of them a while back. Now, no, I don't do a big group at a time. Uh, it, it might only be like 15 plants, and a few of them are going to turn out to be males. With my sour bubble, the strain is about 70% female, maybe 65. So right now, I'm doing it again. And the last time, I had a couple of promising keepers. And uh, another guy just showed his keeper from Sour Bubble that he selected on the Instagram, and it's the bubble gum version of Sour Bubble. And it's not an uncommon one, and it's super delicious and sticky and frosty and finishes real fast. But the one I had wasn't a very big yielder, and I didn't think it was quite as strong as, as you know, the other phenotypes. So then there was another one that I also thought was a possible keeper. And it didn't have the same taste that I was looking for, but it was really strong and it had an interesting taste, but we just wasn't sure it was good enough. And so we're doing another look right now. Now, the way I do it is I, this time I, uh, had a set of sour bubble seeds. I wanted to go ahead and check out some of the ones that looked marginal, actually, small and marginal, and that I probably wouldn't have sold anyhow. And it was funny, all germinated, you know? And I thought, well, let's just see how they grow, you know, and if they're runts or anything. And I guess out of the bunch, we might have had a couple that died off or were weird, but I've got a group of plants now there must be about 10 of them. And we, what we do is we number them all, and we clone them all, and we keep the clones. And, you know, often the males, because, you know, usually they just die, you know. 
anyhow, you can clone a male, but it's hard. And then after we find out which ones are the females, we go ahead and flower out the big plants. You see, I got a limited size indoor grow, and I, I'm just trying to, you know, do everything in sequence, and so it can't be all that many at all one time. Now, when I get those into flower, which is really soon, they're getting huge, uh, we'll just, you know, finish them out. We'll try the different kinds of bud, and we'll, we'll write up, you know, what I thought about each phenotype and uh, see if there's something... Like at this point, uh, everybody wants something that's a good yielder. And sour bubble, it's just a moderate yielder. It's not a great yielder. I've I've grown big plants, you know, to show that it's possible. But it takes a while vegging it, and then they flower fast. They, they tend to not be the biggest yielders. We'd like to find one that's really good. It has similar taste to my old clone, and uh, that yields more, and it has higher content like the old clone did originally sounds like the dream combo <laughs> so this is going to be a bit of an interesting question because i'm not sure on the timeline but how do you feel about what it appears to be to me the fact that like barney's farm stole the lsd name from you well i didn't look at it that way you know the truth is when i named lsd hey Here's something Res Dog had something to do with. Name and see. We were talking about it. And I says, What am I going to call this shit? I said, It's Lifesaver. It's crossed with Soma's Diesel. He says, Huh, let me see. LSD. So he actually came up with a name. I went like, Duh. Okay, good idea. Good idea. And I did name it LSD. And I do think it was after my LSD, yes, probably a couple of years later, at least. The Barney's Farm came out with their LSD. But do we know that they were even aware that there was another LSD? And did they claim it was bog LSD? No, they didn't. And did it have the same components? No. And did they tell what the components were? Yes, they did. And so even if the strains are similar, they came from different origins. I don't think they just knocked off my LSD seeds. I think they made their own. And they came up with their own name from the same abbreviation system of, like, lemon skunk diesel or whatever is in it. Yeah, okay. So do you think, though, that there should be some sort of standard by which if a name already exists, you you know, like there's some rules you should follow? Or do you think it's fine so long as, like, you know, you state what it is and so if people look into the details, they'll be able to see that it's different? I think it's fine as long as you're not dishonest. I think it's awful to to uh, not give somebody the credit they deserve if you use their work. Uh, I think it's awful to try to steal, you know, somebody's strain. But when it comes to names, look, there's a bunch of sour grapes. I'm not so sure that mine was the first sour grape. I sure didn't know of another one, but they're probably one. The thing is, mine is box sour grape. And I can tell you what's in it. And I have told everybody what's in it. And it's the truth. And it's the only reason I can remember anything is because I always tell the truth. If I did lie to make it look better or sound cooler or something, I could never keep all the lies straight. I mean, I'm an old guy. And a lot of the stuff you're asking me to remember, you know, was, you know, 15 years ago or more. Yeah, totally. Sorry to put you under the pressure like that. So. <laughs> well, no, I've enjoyed it just fine. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, I'm an old stoner. And in my memories, the worst things are uh, the actual names of people. But I did I did meet a lot of the big breeders. You know, I, I did go to Amsterdam a few times. I traveled with Gypsy and his Jaguar in Europe. I drove his Jaguar, man. It went 156 miles an hour. It was a nice big car. And, man, that was so cool. I mean, cruising the Autobahn and stuff, man. We were we were uh, down in Switzerland. We went to Breeder Steve's greenhouses and stuff just before he got up. I, I was worried that us being there, the pictures that were shown could have led to him getting in trouble. And I 
thought, fuck, man, we were all pretty careless. Yeah, wow, that sounds very much like the heyday. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it was like I, when I first got into this business with Gypsy, you know, I mean, he was the one that asked me to make seeds for him. And he uh, had put up a picture of this bubble gum because he knew I grew bubble gum, you know, and he had had a wind free pack of, bo of seeds if you can tell me what this strain was. And the picture showed how it was all popcorned out, the bud, the way bubble gum should look when it's done. And I right away said, well, it looks like bubble gum to me. And he says, oh, yeah, you win, Bushy. You you definitely get the, the pack of bubble gum seeds. So I got another pack of bubble gum seeds, and they were uh, Simon's. Uh, and uh, I grew those. And, you know, they were a lot different than, than my bubble gum. And they tasted and smelled like bubble gum too, but a little bit more like cotton candy to me than my bubble gum. And I also thought that while it was a large plant and everything, it was awfully woody, like it was more wood and tree than it was bud, you know? But of course, phenotypes vary a little bit, and who knows how many I had to work with, just one pack, I think, of those. Yeah, okay. I've heard people comment about that, about how I think um, there's kind of a more indica-leaning bubblegum, and I think Simon's may have been the more sativa-leaning one. I don't know if it was more sativa or not. It definitely had this woody and stout structure. Uh, uh, it definitely was, you know, a pretty good size plant, but I, I thought it was just as indica-sided, in my, my opinion. Yeah, okay, I could be offered that one. So, I mean, while talking about you having your little holiday in Europe, is the European market something you want to explore more, or are you just already too busy trying to keep up with domestic? Well, we've been limited in our ability to stay, uh, like, distributing to to distributors in other countries. Um, we... Uh, after you know some problems that Res Dog had, we decided to go domestic for a while, and we're entertaining the notions of certain countries uh, that allow it. That we are, you know, talking to people, some people interested in having distributorships, and uh, so far, right now, I do have distributors who will ship anywhere in the world or just about anywhere but they're based in the U.S. Yeah, cool. So anyone can get them, if you're wondering, all my Australian friends. <laughs> Inevitably, I get, a, I get that question. Well, I would also like people to know if they want information about who my distributors are and where they can be found and reached, that they can always check out Bog or Bog Seeds at Instagram, or I'm willing to get my uh, email address if you would allow that. Yeah, of course. Well, we can give information on obtaining seeds depending on where you are at Bogland, B-O-G-L-A-N-D, 72 at gmail.com. Yeah, fantastic. And, of course, you can get them from Seeds Here Now, one of our favorite sponsors. Seeds Here Now is our, uh, our largest distributor, and uh, they have done a great job for us. And, you can be assured that if you deal with them, you'll be satisfied and you'll be getting the best service around. That's the one. So, sorry, just to uh, jump back to the question I was going to ask, i got a legal question here. So it's, it's a bit of an interesting one, but I, I want to hear your opinion on it. Where do you see the future of cannabis going in California? Because obviously that's what you're probably more familiar with. And do you think that the world will follow California's suit? I hope not. Honestly, uh, Eddie Lepp is a good friend of mine. He's a cannabis activist out here, as am I. In California, we had the longest running medical marijuana system of any state. We ran it for like 15 years with no problems. Believe me, a cottage industry, people could take their half a pound or whatever to a local dispensary. They could be paid for it. 
they could go home and they could afford to have a roof over their head. Legalization, well, we've always all wanted legalization, but we want sanity. This kind of legalization is just regulating it far too much, taxing it far too much, with no exceptions for medical users, senior citizens, or people that want to grow, be limited to like four plants. No, this isn't going to stand. Eddie Lepp and I and a lot of other people involved in the medical industry out here are furious with the fact that they lied about the promises that our medical rights would not be lost. Well, maybe not for a year or so. Yes, they are threatened, and we are working on ballot initiatives to get our medical rights protected. And listen, I'm, I'm naturopathic. I'm into health, and I believe in medicine and doctors and all that, but I believe in the personal right of a person to grow herbs for their own use. And I mean any plant, and I don't care what plant. The fact is that if it's for your own use and you're not even selling it, it's nobody's business but your own. And there's a lot of people that think it's healthier than a lot of the medicines that people use. For God's sakes, it's the pharmaceuticals that got everybody addicted on opiates. If people were growing their own opium poppies and bleeding them and putting that on their weed and smoking it, they wouldn't even get addicted to it because it would be at such a low level. But it's not in its natural form. You know, that's why I like raw cannabis much better than concentrates. Yeah, I know, raw cannabis, it's a fresh produce, and it doesn't last forever, and we got a lot of it, and we need to turn a lot of it into concentrates. But what I like is fresh cannabis, and I honestly think that it's, it's healthy, and maybe it's healthier to vape than to smoke, but I still smoke it. After all these years, my wife and I smoke smoking all kinds of marijuana, it hasn't harmed us. It kept us from getting cancer. I smoked cigarettes for years, and I had a heart bypass operation 25 years ago. But cannabis has kept me alive since then. Yeah, wow. What an incredible testimony. So with that being said, what legal changes do you think need to occur to facilitate a more productive cannabis industry and just culture? Well, to tell you the truth, I agree with Governor Brown and the governor of Colorado and a lot of people, and this may sound crazy to you, but I was not for this legalization proposition. And a lot of people in Oregon and Ohio, you know, the horrible thing they set up in Ohio where just five farms would have a monopoly growing all the weed in Ohio. And the voters voted it down, just like California voted legalization down the first time. And they voted it down because it was all commercialistic. It was all about taxes. There's the only reason they're doing it. And, you know, I don't begrudge a recreational system. There can be a recreational system of legal weed. And there can also be the medical marijuana system where people don't have to work in the same fashion and it doesn't have to be taxed so heavily. Yeah, of course. And so do you think that, that is a potential for California to go back to like the former model, or do you think you've almost come too far? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know what the future will bring. I do think that a nationwide medical marijuana system would make more sense. But I, I understand they just think everything commercially in the business world, like make it fewer producers to make sure you're able to collect all your taxes. You know, we could have made sure that all the all the I was safe. So there could have been a system set up that would have preserved a cottage industry. It's going to create and is creating a disaster in the states where they took away the medical marijuana and put it in effect legal marijuana. The same thing's happening in Canada right now. And that's a whole country, you know, they just legalized it. Well, one of the seed companies that I sell seeds to up in Canada just informed us that she's not allowed to sell seeds anymore. Now, how is that legalization, man? Yeah, it's one step forward, three steps back. So. Well, that's exactly what I mean. Everything was just fine in California with the medical system that we had. And I didn't hear anybody complaining, you know. But real commercial interests, you know, it's like the politicians didn't want to pass a bill to legalize marijuana. So what they do? 
you, you can't change a ballot initiative in California in Congress without having like a two-thirds vote in both House. So they got another ballot initiative up. It made it look like this was going to be good, good, you know. And all people can buy now is a lesser grade of marijuana at a higher price, or they have to go back underground to you know, the black market to get good weed at a reasonable price from one of their friends. Yeah. <clears throat> Just as a bit of a change of pace, because that's all the legal questions we had. We've got a question here that was submitted by one of our uh, Patreon viewers. However... I'm actually not that familiar with it, so I'm hoping you're just going to be able to take the reins and answer this one here. The question is, what are the common mistakes you see people making when they're making water hash at home or bubble hash? Oh, okay. I love bubble hash, and I still make that all the time, and I'm just getting ready to make a whole a whole bunch of it to put away and store for myself right now. Don't even have any plans of selling it. Uh, I'll tell you how I do it, first of all. You know, Bubble Man is a friend of mine from back in the days of either Overgrow or Icy Mag, whenever he came out with his bags anyhow. I was one of the first guys that he wanted to send a free set of three bags to because he knew I'd make the hash and how many followers I had at the Overgrow or Icy Mag. And so I appreciated that, and I read his thread about how you do it, and uh I pretty much followed his directions and found that my different strains produced the different hashes and that uh, for a while, you know, we were uh, mostly making bog bubble hash and then switched over to making sour bubble hash. <clears throat> the sour bubble hash turned out, it, it, we did get that tested and it did turn out to be uh, pretty darn good for bubble hash and the way I made it wasn't all that special. But it was it was nearly 60 percent. Still, it's nearly 60 percent THC, uh, and not too much CBD. But it, it comes out really dark, like a really dark red to black. And uh, I really like the the hash that comes from the sour bubble. But my process is pretty simple, and you know. I really think that it's not necessary to use a whole l large number of bags. I just use two bags, I mean three. Uh, I think one of the mistakes people make is is taking out and separating away from the hash uh, resins that are uh, in the like 120 range, okay? Like I mix and, and strain my weed in a 220, and then that bag goes into a 160, and I do a second strain with the 160, and then I just catch it all in a 45. Now, unless your strain is really high quality and your trim is just sugar leaves, like I use really top grade trim, this won't work for you. But it works for me in Sour Bubble, and what it does to improve the hash is the larger stuff, like the 130, 140, that gets through the 160 bag, there's a lot of flavor in that. And that, that's what people aren't realizing. They're just going ahead, separating that out and using it in their edibles or whatever <clears throat> because it's lighter weight hash. And then a lot of them collect in the 73, which is good. But believe me, there's stuff going through the 73 that's also good. So if you catch it all in the 45, from the 160 to the 45, and it's really high quality trim that you put in there, then you can get a good amount of a more flavorful bubble hash. See, the thing about bubble hash is you don't want them to all be the same. And that's what I find sometimes a lot of concentrates is, is hash gets to be hash, you know. Well, more flavor. Like if, if you've smoked the old conventional hashes and you know how good they taste, like these fingers, like good Moroccan or good Reb Lebanese or blonde Lebanese. These ganaches weren't as strong as the bubble hashes we make now by any means, but they were delicious. And, you know, to me, that's a big deal. Uh, I don't often agree with everything that DJ Short says. And, you know, so one time he was talking, I was listening, I know him slightly, um, about how people are trying to just jack up and get these highest potency strains like 
it's like adding neutral spirits to fine wine or something, you know? Well, I, I see his point and all, but my sour bubble's really strong and it's really good. And so <laughs> I, I don't think there's a problem with him having good power. Yeah, no, I agree. So on to the last question before we do our last little quick fire ones. So we've kind of already touched on this, but just to get a clarification, where do you sit on the issue of people breeding with your work? Specifically, do you like it if someone comes to you and says, you know, hey, I've got this thing I'm doing, is that okay? Or do you kind of think like there's no onus for them to contact you and ask for permission or anything? Like, where do you sit? Well, I like it when a person shows me the respect to ask permission, but I don't expect that. And you know, the truth is when I sell you my seeds, you bought them and you own them and you can do what you please with them. Now, if you actually make seeds, my seeds, I hope that it will at least be a cross with something else and not just a knockoff of my strain. And they wouldn't just make a knockoff of my strain and call it exactly the same. But I wouldn't mind if you made a strain and then you told what was truthfully in it and gave me a little credit. Now, that's good enough for me because... You know, I'm I'm actually more a part of the past of this industry than I am the future. I mean, I know what I'd like to see, and what I'd like to see is that everybody contributing and coming up with new stuff on their own, like back in the day, having so much fun doing it. Yeah, fantastic. What a great sentiment. So, on to our last little few questions. I call them the quick fire section. So... Let's jump into them. It's just five quick little questions. So, what is your favorite strain that you think has got a bit of a bad rap? I'm thinking. I'll tell you. I do think that uh, sometimes bubble gum doesn't get the rap it deserves. Now, maybe you think it never got a bad rap, but the truth is I remember... Uh, things like, you know, it's kind of inconsistent or, or, or runts or mutants or something like that. And I don't ever remember any of my seeds being that way, that they were always hardy and healthy. Other complaints that it really wasn't very strong, you know. Well, I, I, I remember I, I had people say to me, well, why do you like to grow bubble gum? You know, I mean, it's really not that strong. Well, it seems strong to me. I mean, it's got the indica high. It's very relaxing. And, you know, I, I'm i not so sure. I know many strains that have gotten such a bad rap, you know. I mean, uh, well, I, I think of a few. I don't want any negativity on any other strains from any other breeders, you know. I'm a really nice guy, and I wouldn't want to point out you know, some bad work that some other breeder did, okay? Uh, <laughs> you just answered the next question, which was going to be, what is the your least favorite strain? Maybe, you know, it doesn't have to be something from someone else. It could just be a general thing, you know, you might... Oh, well, to tell you the truth, uh, even though uh, I recognize how strong it is and how good it is, there are, I really don't like that much. <laughs> Most sour diesels are too fuely for me. And I won't smoke them. I smoked one so strong one time, it practically put me down on my knees, okay? I know how strong it can be. Uh, uh, some of the cow dog stuff, I really don't like the taste. And, uh, no, I, I, I like train wreck, and people got sick of the taste of that, and maybe it got a bad rep. But train wreck is a great old strain that I would still consider working on. Yeah, wow. Maybe we need that because no one is working with it, really. Well, the truth is that it has a great pain-killing effect. And uh, I like the taste, but people get sick of the taste. And, you know, of my strains, like one of the best-tasting ones that has, like, a lot of nose and flavor is the Blue Moon Rocks. But I love this stuff, but I couldn't just smoke it all the time. It's like after a while, you definitely want something else because it's just so strong a kind of blueberry taste. Yeah, wow. That sounds like what I need in my life. 
Oh, it's beautiful stuff. You know, the blue Kush yields a little less, but it's even stronger. They're both related. And uh, I didn't talk about it, but the blue moon rocks, one of my old strains, that it was an old clone blue moon. Uh, and that had a blueberry in it that wasn't DJ's. It was Vic's blueberry. And so it makes my blue moon rocks considerably different blueberry that's not as dark purple as DJ's, but yields real well. Yeah, okay. I might need to take a little investigation into that one myself by the sounds of it. So, Well, the Blue Moon clone was given to me uh, either uh, by one or two guys, okay? And I'm not sure if those seeds were given to me by Subcool, but I had a friend in Florida named Tommy, and I think he sent me the seeds, and he told me that the Blue Moon was a cross of this Vicks blueberry, and I remember Vic from back in the overgrow times, and uh, Meganopy Moonbeam. And you know, there was a blue moonshine that came out after Blue Moon, which was different, okay? It was probably Blue Moon crossed with something else. But anyhow, I got the seeds of the Blue Moon, and I didn't want to change it that much. You know, that would be my bubble berry, but the fact is that I kept it more like the Blue Moon than bringing it to my bubblegum side. Yeah, okay. So the next question is desert island situation. You can only take two strains with you to this desert island. You have unlimited amounts of it, but you can only pick two strains. Which two? Well, Sour Bubble would definitely be one of them. Uh, there, There's a, several others that I really like a lot. And, you know, it's really fun to grow the strawberry and... The sour grape is of nearly comparable quality. Those three, the sour bubble, the sour grape, and the strawberry. But I wanted to mention sour boggle because, you know, my boggle gum was one of my original strains that we crossed to the sour bubble. And the sour boggle came out surprising results in that it's very bubble gummy flavored. Uh, it's very up daytime high, unlike most of the mostly bubblegum flavored ones. And, you know, it's got a taste uh, that there's something besides the bubblegum, but uh, I kind of call it a champagne bubblegum for some reason, kind of like a gold bubblegum. Yeah, that sounds great. So that might be the other one, you know? Yeah, okay. So you got your two, bog bubble and the uh, sour bubble. I, I think... I think sour bubble and the sour boggle, which is sour boggle gum. Uh, yeah, that's the one. So this is one of my favorite questions. If you could go back to any point in time and history, as well as anywhere in the world, to presumably collect some land race seeds, where would you go and what period? That's a good question. You know, Land race seeds, working with them, it's definitely like would be very rewarding, you know, to say this is, you know, the Congo Bongo, you know, this is what they grew there for hundreds of years. And you worked with it and you, you know, bred and selected until you got it even more potent. You know, most of the land race strains really start out not being all that great. And I'm not sure, but it seems to me that. It would have been a long time ago, and I would be thinking Asia, you know? Like, you know, one of the things, maybe maybe mountainous regions where, you know, the, the, uh, the fast-flowering uh, Kushas, it seems like, like in India, where the Hindu religion, do you know that when they were their students uh, in religion and spirituality, that they would drink bang, which was a mild cannabis beverage, to make them more astute, more able to learn. So maybe an Indian strain. Yeah, okay. That's certainly one that's not, not explored much currently, the Indian genetics. Oh, well, it's just that they have an ancient history of cannabis use and it, it's interesting to me, and I am kind of a history buff, but most kind of history that I study is like ancient aliens and stuff, man. Have you seen 
that there's like pyramids all over the world and there's pyramids on the moon and there's pyramids on Mars and out in the asteroid belt, there's a dwarf planet called Sirius and they showed pictures of one of our probes went out through the asteroid belt and took pictures of this planet. There is a six mile high pyramid on Sirius, man. All I can say is I'm so happy you just said all of this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. Well, I tell you, the aliens are out there, man, and they're already here, too. And the fact is that I don't really trust them, but they have telepathy. They can look just like regular people, and I don't trust them, but they seem nice. Wow, yeah. You want to... Just shine the spotlight on someone, name and shame someone? Well, I can tell you, you know, like, like I actually had experiences that are real, not just made up mythical stuff about Bog living in a cave or anything like that, but that when I was just seven years old and I was in a Kresge store in Birmingham, Michigan, my mom let me go look at the toy section while she was shopping which was the usual thing. And I'm walking down the aisle and here a man in a business suit is facing me down the aisle, like 15 feet away from me and has telepathy to me. You know, we have an eye contact and this is what he said. I swear to God, he said, I'm from another planet. And he says, there's a million of us here and we're here to help you. And he walked right on by and mouth dropped open and I told my family about it, and they knew that I didn't make up stories when I was a little kid or anything. So that happened. And then when my wife and I were first married, it was 1974. We'd been married a couple of years. We were in central Michigan. It's just one summer where we saw a bunch of UFOs. And I mean, I had other people at my house see them too, and, and my family, my parents, my sister, her husband, her kid. The, the darn things were flying around, and they were triangular, most of them. And then and one night, uh, my wife and I, just alone, and we had taken some shrooms. So you could say, wow, you were just tripping. But we didn't see shit like this when we took shrooms, okay? We saw something come down and land on the road in front of our neighbor's house, which is like a quarter mile away, okay? And this wasn't triangular, and it landed. And it looked kind of like a bus, you know, like a short bus or something or a shuttlecraft from the Starship Enterprise. And it landed on the road, like, I guess, facing away from us. And I got binoculars. We're up in our yard and I'm looking at it. And the thing rotated like an army tank in the road. And a, a hole opened up. It had sort of a hood on the front that stuck out. And a hatch opened up on the front of its hood. And I had to pull the binoculars away real quick as a giant light, a bright arc light, came up through the hole in the front of that thing. And after it turned on this huge bright light, it was the craziest thing you ever saw, man. I swear to God, it's the whole truth. My wife and I, there was a large field, a kitty corner from our house. We're out at a farm in the country on dirt road. And this large field across from the neighbor's house, it went out in that field and it skimmed it like an air cushion vehicle or like something that could have been making a circle, zipping around the field back and forth so fast that it looked like a cartoon, like it couldn't be real or something, you know? And then the thing actually went down to the river or creek anyhow, and it's turned off its light and it sat on the ground in the river there for possibly a half an hour and while it was on the ground, it had little remote sentry vehicles marching back and forth to a corner right over us, basically, on its perimeter. And after it was there for about a half an hour, it, it took off. And this was the strangest part, you know. The other ones, they were always pretty quiet, you know, nothing but a low hum. This one, when it took off the ground, it was going straight up, slowly, and the lights were revolving around each other and it had a whining sound noise building up like we'd never heard from one of them. And it reached a certain altitude and the red lights were spinning real fast and the whining was real loud. 
and all of a sudden it shot at an angle really high, like for orbit. And it took off so fast, I swear it would have killed a human. It sent three shockwaves that almost broke my front window. It buckled in and out three times and later did break in a storm. And that thing shot across the sky at the highest angle, like a jail, it was going up, and then just disappeared. It was so fast. Anyhow, that's my story. Wow, that was full on. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, no, I, I don't think you could make that up. <laughs> Believe me, I wouldn't. And I know how crazy it sounds, all right? And I even admit that we took a couple of shrooms that night. But maybe it somehow allowed us to see something that we normally wouldn't have seen. Now, the next day, I went and looked around out in that field on a dirt bike. Like, did it knock down a fence or anything? Did it make any marks in the weeds? Did it, nothing. There was no trace of anything. So, it might have been an encounter of the second kind because it did make my window bounce in and out and the shockwave did hit us in the chest like an air cannon, you know? It's what it felt like. It broke the sound barrier instantly. Wow. Yeah, okay. So I think we could probably get stuck on this all day. Maybe we should, maybe we should jump back to the last question. <laughs> yeah. So our absolute last question. It's a good one. If you could recommend one bog strain to anyone out there, regardless of their skill level, their experience, all that, what would it be? Well, I guess it would say it would be boggle gum because I, I want them to be successful if they're novices. I want them to have a nice yielding good product that they would probably be happy to grow if they're not novices. And I think that it is exemplary of our strains because it does very much have the bubblegum taste that I love and it also is easy for anybody to grow. What a great answer. So, brings us to about the end of it. Did you have any comments or shout-outs you wanted to make at all? Well, I didn't really plan on talking about the aliens or anything. And You know, if I was crazy, I'd still be seeing them, and I'm not. So, I'm pretty sure they're still around. But I'm not trying to say I know what their agenda is or anything. You know, I'm kind of a Buddhist Christian, and I'm just a believer in the golden rule. And I, I really don't believe in in accumulating wealth. I mean, I've lived pretty well all my life. I've been a pretty lucky kid. Uh, I appreciate that I've had the love of a good woman for 48 years and that until one of us dies, we'll still have that. And you know, we shared our marijuana every day that we could, I mean, almost every day, all those years. And I have to say that it's been a sacrament for us, that it's it's been uh, a rite that we do. And Soma says the same thing, his daily sacrament. And you know, that's the way we look at it. It's not like, it's not like I really want to get blasted all the time. And it's not like I really have to get high. But we get up in the morning and after a while, you know, drinking some coffee and watching TV. When we do smoke some, then it does open our minds. And the good thing about cannabis is that it does stimulate creative thinking. And the biggest miracle of cannabis is it will allow you to forget. And you know, it's hard to forget the things that are worrying you, the things that are bothering you. A lot of people feel depressed a lot of the time. A number of my strains are very antidepressant in effects. And I don't think it's a phony thing, you know? Honestly, we use medicines all the time. And it's more like aromatherapy. It doesn't take that. I mean, a really small amount of cannabis can be enough to completely change someone's frame of mind because Believe me, that's an internal thing. Whether you're happy or not, look in the mirror. Can you smile at yourself? Can you give yourself a big smile? Do you know that you'll feel happy just by smiling? Well, you know, it's just a thought from an old guy that has a few mood swings now and then himself. And uh, anxiety and worries and pressure and that's what cannabis is for. I mean, it's an anti-stress thing. It's like, that's why you get the munchies, because now it's time to relax. 
and that means that we can stop fighting for a while and we can we can stock up on food and we can have some sleep and and we can laugh it off you know the day's troubles and if if i didn't have it you know i i'd definitely not, not be a nicer person okay and i'm not saying that everybody needs it or anything but i do <laughs> no i can agree with that one so thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today bob well, I enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate it. And uh, to all your listeners, uh, thank you for listening to me. And there we have it, guys. A big, big, big thank you to Bog for stopping by. And a big thanks for you guys for hanging around till the end. As always, huge shout out to our Patreon fans. These guys are the lifeblood of the show. We've got a really cool episode coming up. Make sure to check out the Patreon episode if you want to get access to it. And a huge thank you to our sponsors as always. Seeds here now, best in the game, I'll say it again. 420 Australia, Organic Gardening Solutions. The premier store, lifestyle and gardening. We'll see you guys next time. See you.